Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I have uh, these boys here. They only got about 10 minutes each to, to, uh, to share. They told me a long time ago it doesn't matter with uh, how what how much time you you have. I, I attended uh, I attended uh, one of these gatherings uh, here about maybe 29 years ago uh, when it was held at Windsor Park, and uh, there's a woman that came and talked there one time. She didn't say nothing. She just started crying. I think she cried for about 10 minutes in front of the mic, and she got a standing ovation. You know. Everybody knew, everybody knew what she felt. So, when I'm telling the boys here, they only got ten minutes apiece. <laughs> 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 we have uh, Adawa, Chippewa, and uh, Micmac. So we got a variety, got a variety of uh, Razas on the North Shore, and the North Shore, and uh, on the East Shore. The very east shore and uh, way blurred by the Atlantic someplace. <laughs> so we're okay this morning. We're going to start off with Gary here. He's got the he's got his ceremonial hat on that we used this morning. So I want everybody to give Gary a very warm welcome. Miigwech. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gary, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here this morning. I guess I should uh, cry for five minutes <laughs> and talk real fast for five. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here this morning. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I come from a reserve. It's called uh, the Mississauga Reserve. And uh, I was just thinking as Peter was talking that uh, my mom is uh, Ojibwe and my uh, dad is uh, uh, Odawa. And so that makes me a half-breed. Eh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyways, uh, I was born uh, not too sure, I think about Blind River or uh, Mississauga. Uh, and uh, I don't remember too much back then. Of course, uh, I was a little bit small then, but uh, I'm nervous. <laughs> but uh, my drinking started when I was when I was young. I uh, I was thinking not too long ago that. Uh, I used to say I didn't like drinking, but then when I come to think of it later on, I was thinking that I did like drinking. I liked drinking an awful lot, but uh, uh, for me it was, uh, I guess I used it as, used it as a, an escape and uh, from problems that I was experiencing at the time. and. Uh, I didn't know how to uh, to handle it right off the bat. I couldn't I couldn't stop. That first night, I, the first time I had anything to do with alcohol, I I, I got in pro, I got in trouble. Uh, I didn't drink that first time that I was having that I, that I uh, had anything to do with alcohol. A friend and I stole some wine and we were going to his reserve to drink, but then the police pulled me off the off the bus, and uh, I spent the night in jail. <laughs> I was young that time, must have been about 12 or 13. And later on I heard that uh, if you go back drinking, it's going to get worse, and that's what happened. It just kept on getting worse. Uh, when I was, uh, later on when I was, uh, when I was turning uh, 21, it was 21 at the time for, uh, to to get in bars, uh, and I had been drinking in the bars for about a year, but that night, uh, just when I was going to turn legal age, uh, 
the police come in the jail. I'm not the. They came in the bar and they uh, they pulled me out of there about 11 o'clock because I I was 20 and at uh, 21 I turned. Uh, I mean, at uh, 12 o'clock, I turned 21. And they, they charged me for that. Uh, they charged me for it, anyways. But uh, seeing that drinking, every time I had anything to do with alcohol, I, I suffered. Uh, during the last part of my drinking, I uh, I ended up going to jail. And uh, when I first came around the program they told me that uh, they told me that uh, if I uh, things are, things were just going to get worse all the time every time I went went back out drinking and at the time I had a family I had children and uh, I ended up losing it all uh, and then at the end I was uh, toward the last I was I ended up going to jail uh, I got caught for stealing uh, the judge told me, he says, uh, if you come back here, he says, I'll, I'll, uh, you'll be going to jail. So I got caught stealing a jacket, and then uh, when I went to court, that's what he told me. So next time, uh, a couple, a couple about, a, about, a, about a month down the road, I, I, I figured it was safe, and I started taking small things again, and then all of a sudden, I went in the grocery store, and I I stole some pepperonis and I ended up in jail. Everybody was telling me, telling about all the things they did to get in jail. I, I wouldn't tell anybody that I stole pepperonis to get in jail. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, but things just I just couldn't seem to do anything right. Um, but I think the thing that got me here was toward the end I was a very lonely person. I was. Uh, Really confused, and I had nowhere else to go. I, I, I didn't understand that second and third step that they talk about in the program to find out an understanding of your own higher power. Uh, and I just had a hard time with that. But at uh, the last of my drinking, uh, that's I had nowhere else to turn, and then that's what happened to me that day. I, day I, I stopped. I said, God, help me not to drink anymore and help me not to do drugs. And I haven't had to go back there since. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, things were, were okay, you know. I uh, I still had to learn an awful lot about myself. Uh, and over over the years that uh, I've, I've stayed sober, I've made an awful lot of mistakes. And I've had to learn from these mistakes. But the thing that helped me so much is uh, you people kept keep on telling me, you keep on telling me, keep coming back, you know. And that's what I keep on doing, you know. I keep coming back to this program, and it uh, it's saved my life, you know. Later on, I had a, I uh, when I lost my marriage, I got into another relationship, and I I have I have my daughter who's with me today. Uh, uh, and because of alcohol too, we, uh, the relationship ended up uh, my my uh, <clears throat> my partner isn't with me. She hasn't been with me for about three years now. But I have my daughter, and I'm and I'm bringing up my daughter, uh, and that's 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 pretty 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 good for a person that uh, it's a big responsibility, you know. Uh, I was just saying this morning that I don't like doing all the things that normal people do. You know, they uh, they wash clothes and they uh, they uh, they have to wash wash floors. Uh, they gotta wash dishes. Uh, I hate all those things, <laughs> but it's a must. <laughs> but all these things. Uh, you people have taught me that, you know. Uh, just by staying sober, I, I have a chance to, I have a chance at life, you know. Uh, no matter what has happened in the past, I have a, a chance to rectify all these things. And uh, I'm learning by uh, the examples of the people in the program. Uh, and so I guess that's my ten minutes. Thank you very much.
me much. Thank you, Gary, for that. Uh, very good. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we have the next guy there is from down the line, uh, Thessalon. He's a Thessalonian. <laughs> the Clay is his name. Is uh, his his uh, earth name here in the Mother Earth? Uh, Clay. I often think about uh, when I introduce these guys, even at uh, our ceremonies, when I look at them. The, the thanks we gave this morning uh, for everything. We're okay. It's right off the bat, we asked the Creator this morning uh, when we were in a circle to have a good day. So we're going to have a good day. That's the, that's the sure thing, you know. And uh, this guy is, uh, if we want power and strength in our circles, this is the guy we usually get. He's a big guy. He's a big man. He's got a big heart. I want you to welcome uh, Matthew. My name is Matthew, and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> I'm nervous. <laughs> like everyone else, I guess. And um, I'm from Tesla, and I was born in Tesla. And I traveled when I first started to drink, when I was 16. My first drink was 571B. That's wine. <laughs> Corked it. Threw the cap away, but I didn't remember hitting the bottle, the bottom of the bottle, because I was so young. <clears throat> and uh, eventually it got worse. It started on the weekends, after school, on Friday night. Then it got worse all weekend. My dad used to ground me, but I used to run away. I didn't listen. And it got worse. The, the, the older I got, the worse I got. Soon, uh, I was in the bars when I was 16, up here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, there was one bar near the, the old Oco building on Queen. I borrowed somebody's ID, and their ID said 29, and I was only 16. And they asked me, it, it, they, they grabbed that sheet. He says, uh, what's your mother's name? Stumped me. What is it? <laughs> I, I, it should be on that paper. <laughs> he says, out you go. <laughs> and then uh, I says, how am I going to get back in? So I'll go to a different bar. And that one served me. Huh? And, and and I used to do it with my last name, Clay, fight. Gas is clay. <clears throat> I used to run around on the tables, fighting all the time. Ending up in jail, Bruce Hill. That was my second home, I used to call it. My first home was the bar. My second home was the hotel. <clears throat> um, my first home was the Bruce Hill, because I always end up in there after a big drunk. When I woke up, I, I, that's where I was, in Bruce Hill. And uh, before I go to the jail, I, I end up in my, my second home. That's in the hotel. I never used to go to my third home, my regular home, very often. Because I always was on the road. And, and uh, just a few years ago, prior, I just got off the road. Today, I, when I travel, I travel this red road. And our road, sobriety, that's what uh, led me to my road, it was Alcoholics Anonymous. If I didn't find that, that road, I don't think I would be on my road to, the, to they call them the higher power. That's why I'm very grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> that higher power helped me lots. I, I used to say it all the time. I, I used to, you know, sometimes I used to uh, see a roadblock. Eh? Oh, God, help me. Help me through that one, because eh? I used to be half-corked. Eh? And uh, a few times they told me to 
You, how are you? You been drinking today? I says, no. You, well, a couple of drinks before 12. I says, they're fast drinks. If they told me to get out of the car, I would have probably fell on the ground. But no. He says, okay, there's coffee. Our house just around the corner. He says, you can stop there before you carry on. I was smiling. <laughs> he says, well, that's good. But eventually, they caught me. I ended up in, uh, I was in Vancouver then. I, I ended up in uh, Burnaby, prison over there. And uh, 14 days in Paris. And, and I was th- thinking, I says, you know, there's only, there's two ways to skin a cat. I says, how, the first way, I'll get somebody else to drive my car and I'll still drink. But they told me, the judge told me, he says, if you're back in here again drinking, you're going to go longer, and you're going to get your license taken away longer. So I won't get caught behind the wheel, but I'll just keep on drinking. That never, that, that never taught me a lesson either. It just got worse. I said, maybe uh, I might get married. I'm going to get married. That's where I met my, my ex-wife. She's out there. She went back home. And uh, I said, maybe uh, marriage will help me. So I got married out there. I was supposed to go out there for uh, a holiday from here. I was working for uh, the Jams Lumber Mill in Garden River. He says, uh, I'll, I'll let you go for one month. That's five years later, I ended up back in Ontario again. <laughs> so I, so I uh, traveled up in Worcester. I worked up there, too drunk all the time. I used to hitchhike early in the morning, soon as five o'clock in the morning. I, you know, I says, maybe I'll catch the, catch somebody that's bringing a few up there. So I used to get up five o'clock in the morning to hitchhike for, catch that uh, truck to go up in the mountains for eight. By the time I get up there, so, sometimes I used to be late. I used to see the truck going up there. Oh, well, I'll wait till uh, the hotel opens. Then I'll hitchhike back home again. Act like I've been working all day. But uh, I can't talk about my ex because uh, she's not here. But, uh, you know, when I get home, she's half corked anyway. So there's no, I said, well, I, she couldn't tell the difference if I, if I was drinking or not. <clears throat> so quite a few years that went by. We stayed together for 12 years. I got three beautiful daughters with her. I'm a single parent today. And... Uh, it got worse. We got a three-bedroom house down in Tesla First Nation. And it just got worse and worse. The more uh, partying we did, I, uh, I remember out west, there's uh, 11 months in a year, but I can only remember, no, 12 months in a year, and I can only remember 11. <laughs> I lost one whole month. And I still don't know where it is, and I'm not going back to look for it. <laughs> yeah. So it can stay there. Because that was in my drinking years. And uh, today, when I come to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm very grateful for that. That was uh, four years in May when we started the, the program in Tesla First Nation. And and one of the guys were there. He says, uh, he says we're going to have a meeting tonight. He says, you want to come? I thought it was a band member meeting. I said, yeah, okay, I'll be there. <laughs> so I, I sat down at the table, and I seen all these guys coming in. Hmm. I said, they're not from my reserve. I, I don't think it's a band member meeting. I said, maybe they're from uh, Indian office. So I waited, and all these papers started coming out. Of Ooh, I started getting scared. Of I said, maybe I'm in the wrong place. So I said, well, I'll wait. Sit down. They, they read all this here preamble and 12 steps and the 12 traditions and, and uh, daily reflections. And I started listening to that. I said, maybe that guy, my buddy there, would have told everything of what I was doing. I said, I can hear. That's me they're talking about. And then the, these other guys started going around, eh, that little paper. He says, uh, they're talking about themselves. Eh? And I was wondering... You know, maybe he did go over there, you know, explain to all these other guys that what I was doing, and they were talking about me. (laughs) 
I says, uh, so I started looking at him. Eh? Hmm. I said, what, what did he do? What, what, what's he got me into? Eh? So there, I passed it. I, when, when it was my turn, I, I passed. So a few times it went like that. Eh? And, and they kept on, after the meeting, they kept on saying, keep coming back, it's going to get better. Eh? So a uh, month went by. Eh? So I, it was my turn again. Eh? The paper come. I said, my, I'm going to speak this time. I said, uh, when I first come to this meeting, I thought it was a bad member meeting, I told him. I said, uh, and you are all talking about me. I, I don't know why. And uh, I said, uh, I'm very grateful I, I came here. I said, uh, because I'm not drinking. This is where, you know, keep it one day at a time, they told me. You know, don't drink for today. If you're not drinking today, you know, then you all get drunk. <clears throat> so I thought it. I said, oh, that, that sounds reasonable. So, and, and I kept on uh, going back, going back, going back. And um, I uh, I told him, I said, when is it going to get better anyway? When is it going to get better? You know, I, I, I wanted to get better today. He said, well, how long did it take you to get here? Well, I said, 21, 21 years. 21 years, you think it's going to get better overnight? <laughs> it's, going to kind of, it's going to take you about 21 years just to level off. <laughs> so he says, uh, just keep on coming back one day at a time and you'll make it. So May, May the 30th went by and I got four years in. I said, that's amazing. I said, I couldn't even get 24 hours in. <laughs> I said, I look back now. I'm very grateful for that. For you, all these people, you know, I, I, you know, if I see another person speaking, it's got, it's got more years in. I, uh, I said, if I work it one day at a time, I'll be there too. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for, you know, a single parent is very hard. You know, I, I can have a lot of patience, and, and lots of patience with my daughters, eh? because there's two of them in high school, and I got my baby; she's still in public school. Eh? And every once in a while, they, say, they call back, eh? Dad, I forgot my homework. But that night, or that morning, I said, don't forget your homework. And, and they call back, Dad, I forgot my homework. Can you bring it into school? The teacher wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that, because when I was drinking, I'd never seen any of that. See, they're in high school, and I missed half of their public school, because I was drinking. You know, and um, I got a lot of things to be grateful today. Even to wake up in the morning, I, I got grateful for that, that higher power to me, the, the, the sharing and caring. That, that's a gift. And, and, and to see all these people sitting out there, that's a gift. That, that gives me strength to carry on what I want to do in life to keep sober. Thanks for listening. I didn't plan that to have two Mr. Mums here. It just sort of happened. <laughs> I didn't qualify. My name is Peter Minglons. I mean, uh, and I'm, uh, I, I give my last name because you won't remember it anyway in two minutes. <laughs> uh, I've been in the Alcoholics Anonymous now for over 31 years, and uh, I, I, I could have left. I could have left any one of those 31 years, but I think the program is fantastic. That's why I'm still in it. I think that's why people are still in the program, or are in the program, for any length of uh, for any length of time. I, I belong here. This is uh, laid out for me. I didn't, unbeknownst to me before, I didn't know that I was that there was another life such as this. Uh, now I know, uh, or I have known I'm a slow learner, and uh, now I know that I do belong here, and this is my way of life. This is, uh, you come and see me, I'll, I'll usually talk about AA. I won't uh, tell you about uh, how many deer I shot, you know. Probably about how, many, how it works. Uh, this guy here is from... Uh, I heard him a long time ago. He was talking about uh, 
Norris Arm way back over there. And I don't know what those Micmacs are up to. That. They're, they're water people, though. They're a different type of people than us. We're woodland here. But these guys, are, they're water. They're, they'll talk about, he'll talk about water more than anything. Liquid. <laughs> Booze. Yeah. Yeah. I want to also thank, well, uh, the, the committee for asking uh, us here, you know. I was sort of disappointed this spring there when in, uh, I went and took in the, the Rainbow Roundup. There was uh, none, not one of us was even asked to say how it works or uh, traditions over there. And I kind of, uh, I just thought I'd mention that in passing, you know. So it's kind of, it's nice. I, I live in the Sioux. I retired from Algoma Steel. And the people in Sault Ste. Marie, they, they, they seem to, they're my people. You know, they're, I, I am, I don't, I was born in Manitoulin, West Bay, but the Sioux is my, is my town. And, uh, the, some one cares group, sometimes I say no one cares group, uh, is my group, you know. <laughs> Somebody said last night there is, it's the best. And may everybody be the best. One thing I like about Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, I used to say I could speak after Clinton. I, I don't do that. I don't say that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but this is, uh, I heard one time one guy, and I corrected him. He said, well, after somebody spoke, well, it's pretty hard to follow that act. I said, no, it's not an act. We don't, we don't compete here, you know. I could speak probably from... After uh, Norman, what was his, what's his name, Norman? Norman Vincent Peel, yeah. I could speak after him if he was in the program. Because I'm not competing. I am just sharing my story. I'm not trying to be a better speaker than the next person. This is why I'm still in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want you just to give a warm welcome to a good friend of mine from... Uh, Originally from uh, Norris Arm, in, uh, he's a uh, he's a new. <laughs> wow. Hi, friends. My name is Paul. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> God, it's a lot easier down there than it is up here. It's awful early in the morning to have to think, you know. <laughs> yeah. For you. Yeah, for me, yeah. But nevertheless, you know, I'm here. And I have a job to do, I guess, try and share with you a little bit of what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today, and where I came from. And I tell you, it's a, it's a miracle uh, for me to be able to, to stand here uh, with a white shirt on. A white shirt turns me on, you know. Yeah. Especially in the morning. I remember waking up after my first, first wedding. And you know it wasn't my last one when I say the first one. <laughs> and I was lying on the couch. I never even slept with my wife. And I had a hand that was four times the big as this one, all wrapped up. And I woke up on that couch because I just got married that night and knew nothing about it. I missed the whole show. And there was blood. I had a red shirt instead of a white shirt on. The guilt and the remorse that morning, you know, followed through uh, many, many years. You know, my God, once I took my first drink, everybody around me, everyone that cared for me, everyone that had anything to do with me suffered, you know, because I took that first drink. I took my first drink when I was 12 years old. And when I was about 15 years old, I was on the streets. 
I'm so glad today, you know, that I have a program. And I'm so glad today, you know, that you people have the program too. I'm so glad that I'm asked to be a part of this. You see, growing up as the only native family in our little hometown, I was the little boy, that the dirty little boy that lived down underneath the tracks. We lived in a little tar paper shack. And the kids used to stand on the, on the railway tracks and used to throw rocks at our house and scream out, Micmac Indians, Micmac Indians, you know. You see, I'm glad <clears throat> that you people got a program, eh? You don't throw rocks at me. You don't have to like me. But if you got a program, you got to love me. I got that one against you, you know. <laughs> you people taught me that because I didn't, didn't love a lot of you people when I came in here. You know, I didn't like you. There's some people I don't like today in the program, but I love you. You know, and I'd pray for you. You know. When, when uh, the chairman opened up the meeting, he talked about uh, the anonymity at the level of press, radio, and film. You know. I'm just going to read you a little small piece. It's very important for anonymity in the program, especially for the newcomer. You see, nothing can hurt me today because I'm sober and I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, And I've cleaned up the inside and I've cleaned up the outside. But it took longer to clean up the inside than it did clean up the outside. Yeah, I could put on a white shirt, you know, and have another couple of shirts sitting in the, in the closet. You know, and that's something new. I never had that. I never had a closet before. What I had on, that was mine. You know, that's all I had, you know. Holes in my shoes, holes in my pants, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's very important for the media, you know, to easy does it, like, you know. And this is dated back October the 14th, 1992. I was here at a, at a convention uh, down in Waterloo, uh, the Holiday Inn, down on the lakefront. And, and the media, I have a brother, two brothers, and I have lots of, lots of relatives here in Sault Ste. Marie because I used to live here, you know. And, and this says, later on, Paul, a native from Sault Ste. Marie, related how his alcoholism was a family affair, striking his father his brother and sister. You know, my ne my nephew called me up and says, they got a piece in the paper about you. You know, my sister didn't see it. My sister didn't see it. I got a resentment against your paper for a little while. But after I talked to my sponsor and started thinking about it, and I got rid of it, you know. So it's very important for our newcomers because I was... I had a few years of sobriety at that time, you know, and I knew that nothing could hurt me. It caused some problems, yes, a little bit of problem, you know. But I just wanted to, to get that in because I've been carrying that since 1992. And I want to give it to you people now and get rid of it. I don't know. Peter talked about ten minutes, he said, we got, you know. But I haven't done any time, you know, since I've been alco in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if, if you can know how to get drunk or not, or if you know how to stay sober. But you know, if you want to get drunk, if you want to do like I did when I came into this program 24 years ago, is not to do anything that you're told to do. And I didn't. I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous at a very young age because living on the streets, I wasn't good at, at, at stealing and, and, and burning someone's car and stuff like this, you know. So uh, the cops used to catch me and lock me up in jail, 
you know. And I was in jail at a very young age, and, and, and there was a paid cook in there. And he asked me, because I was a young kid, you know, he asked me uh, that each time I get in trouble, have I ever been drinking? And I told him yes. He sat down and he talked with me, you know, and he introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And I was really amazed that he would do that because I was a prisoner and he was just a paid cook right there, you know. And I went to my first meeting after I did, did the rest of my time with that guy, you know. I, I don't know what went on. It was a closed meeting and Jerry told me that I didn't have to say anything, so I just went along with anything because I was looking for a new way of life, you know, something different, you know. I was looking for a way to drink and have fun like it would start off sometimes, you know, and, and not get into all the stuff. I wouldn't beat up my home, you know. I wouldn't wake up in the morning in the bed alone, you know, and all the windows broken out, you know. Like I say, I didn't wake up one morning when things were so beautiful, you know. Nice, sunny morning, you know. And, and, and the window was open and I was lying in a bed. Nice white sheets on the bed. And the drape were blown across the bed. And I could hear my kids out in the backyard playing on the, on the swing and playing with the dog. And my wife was out in the kitchen with an apron on, baking apple pies, setting them on the windowsill to cool off, listening to country and western music. And I jumped out of bed, went out and said to her, guess what, sweetheart? I'm going to join Alcoholics Anonymous and things are going to be okay. I guarantee you, I never had that when I came here. I had it along the way. But once I took that first drink, it took all them things away. Everything went. I had nothing. Nothing when I came here, you know. I went to my first meeting, and Jerry introduced me to the to the to the program. Like they talk about setting the seed, planting the seed in Alcoholics Anonymous. Jerry planted that seed that night in me, and from then on, uh, some of my drinking was screwed up. I couldn't drink the same after that. It took many years after that before I got back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was five years sober. I went back to St. John to look for Jerry, you know, to tell Jerry that, hey, you know, I finally got five years in Jerry after all these years, you know. Someone told me that Jerry was gone. He wasn't with us no more. He quit going to meetings, and he ended up overdosing in the back of his car because he quit going to meetings, you know. So important for me today, you know, to do everything that I have to do today to stay sober, you know. I know what I don't have to do, you know. There's not very much that I don't have to do, you know. I can't say no. I can't say no. It took some time later before I got really come into my first meeting. Twenty-four years ago, I come to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And I tried every way that you could think about to work this program and have a few beer on the side. And I tried everything to work this program, you know, and, 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 and smoke a joint of wheat, you know, or have a little head of acid, you know. I tried everything to do that, you know, and work the program, but I couldn't do it, you know. I ended up trying to commit suicide, you know, because of the way I was living. Ended up in, in, in your big hospital down here, you know because I tried to overdose, because I couldn't live anymore. I couldn't live anymore the way I was living, and I couldn't live into the program, you know. I didn't know how to completely give myself to this simple program, you know. I was looking at it for, for a time, over a long period of time, that I had to do this. I couldn't learn that I had to do it one day at a time, you know. I got Peter's phone number one time when I was... Uh, uh, came came back again. I'm glad that I was allowed to come back, you know, that you people never said, you know, oh no, Paul, you've been here too many times. You don't want it, you go away. You know, I was always welcome back, you know. And it was one of these times that I came back that I see Peter up front, you know. I said, God, that's a big guy. And I always like to pick on the big guys, you know. 
God, you used to have a bit of pity for me, you know, when I get mouldy with them. I say, ah, you're a little small little thing. They wouldn't hit me, you know. Yeah, you know. I always went for the big guys, you know. Sometimes they never, you know. Sometimes I got pinned down on the floor with the chair, you know. But I asked Peter for his phone number. I went out and drank some more, you know. And I drank some more. And I drank some more and end up in jail, end up losing everything, you know. Finally, I, 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 I found Peter's phone number. It's funny, I, I never threw it away or anything, you know. I, I found Peter's phone number and I called his house, you know. And his wife, Kathy, work a program, you know, a good program too. You know, and I said, is Peter home? And she says, no, Peter is not home, she I said, what time would he be in? I'd like to talk to him. I'm hurting. And at that time, I tell you, you know, I never had a thing in this world. I had a big ball in my gut that was coming up in, into my throat and choking me. I had, hardly had a place to live at that time. I, I had a little old trailer out in one of the trailer parks out there. And I never had a friend to talk to. Nobody that could understand me, that I was hurting and I was dying inside. Oh my God. You know, I didn't know where to turn. You know. And, and the worst thing about it is, other times that I used to feel like that, I could take a drink. But this time I couldn't take a drink. I didn't want to drink. And holy God, you know, I was hurting and dying and I couldn't take a drink. Kathy says, come on over. She said, Peter has gone to an AA meeting. He'll be home shortly. He was down on Birch Street at his house, you know. And I walked, walked in, and by this time, Peter had been home. And Sam, I'm, I'm sure you, all of you know Sam has passed on, you know. Peter and Sam were sitting there. And Peter asked me, how was it going? I said, Peter, I don't know. I said, I really don't know how I'm going to get through the rest of this night. And I didn't. I didn't know how I was going to get through the rest of the night. My insides of my body was just a screaming. We sat and we drank coffee and we talked and I cried. and I cried some more and we drank more coffee and I cried some more. We drank coffee, you know. And that's 14 and a half years ago. And we drank some gallons and gallons and gallons of coffee at that kitchen table <laughs> since then. <laughs> and we've talked since then. And we've cried since then at that kitchen table, you know. And I started off in, in sobriety. I started off with, with growing in their family. You know, their family is, is is my family. I become a part of their family, you know, with the kids, watching the kids growing up as I was growing in sobriety and getting things happening in my life and things start to get together, you know. And I start to get another white shirt on, you know. And I'd wake up in the morning and, and it wasn't all dirted up. It might be full of coffee stains or whatever, you know, but that's okay. I know where they came from, you know. And it has been great. It has been great. I, I like to have the time to tell you uh, all the great things that's happened to me over the past 14 years, you know. But if I told you everything, you'd think I'd be bragging, you know. You'd think I'd ha I have an eagle about it. My God, I'm so grateful in, in the mornings. You know, not all the time I'm grateful for everything that, that I have and everything is around me. But I'm so grateful every day that I don't have to take a drink, you know. And I have the friends that I have in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. The people that don't throw rocks at me anymore, you know. It's nice to be a part of this living world, you know. I never thought that I could ever fit in a place like this. I've done everything and tried every way that you could think about to drink and not hurt and not get drunk and not go to jail, not lose my driver's license, and nothing worked. 
when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous for the last time, you know, I've tried everything. Two or three marriages gone down the drain, you know. I met a girl shortly after I got into the program, which wasn't recommended, you know. But again, I wanted to try little things on my own. I figured, you know, I'm the type of an alcoholic that I come up with real good ideas sometimes, you know. <laughs> real bright ideas. And God, you know, I can, can work them out in my head and, and everything is perfect. Falls right in place. One, one, two, three, four. Everything. Nothing can go wrong. Until I go talk to my sponsor. <laughs> Son of a gun, you know, I got to change. I got to change that thing of what I'm thinking about, how to do it, you know. See, that's the type of an alcoholic I am. I come up with bright ideas sometimes, you know, for me. I can't follow through with my bright ideas. I got to talk it over with somebody. Because me alone, I, I'm nothing. You know, I tried that, you know. I tried being doing it my way, and I couldn't do it my way. You know, my way doesn't work. You know, I get up in the morning, you know, and I, I, I go down and I get a coffee, my wife and I, and that's a little tradition thing that we have in our home. Whoever gets up first gets the coffee for the other ones that's in bed. You know, And whoever gets up last makes up the bed. <laughs> so I make sure that I'm up first. <laughs> I hate making beds. <laughs> and my sponsor told me I had to do the dishes. Uh, oh, Jesus. I used to say, a grown man have to get to the sink and do dishes. He said, yeah, try it, he said, before you go to bed. He said, might be good foreplay for you, you know. <laughs> I said, what about somebody comes in and catches me? I didn't want any of you big guys coming in seeing me with a dish, uh, uh, my hands in the dishwater doing dishes and, and drying dishes. My wife sitting down watching the TV for a break, having her tea after, after supper or something. Oh, my God, no. But, you know, I don't care. You know, it cleans my hands, you know. <laughs> I've done the dishes many times, you know. And I make the bed sometimes, you know. And that's nice, you know. I, I can walk away in the morning and go out the door and, and tell my wife that I love her, you know. Give her a kiss. When I come back, I give her another kiss again. You know, it's great. And I can go out and put a key in the ignition of a vehicle and I can start it up and I can drive to work. The thing that turned me on when I, I, I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous at one of my, my, my times in and out and everything, the guy that came and, and got me and picked me up, he was dressed nice. Had a beautiful car, you know. His wife had another car, you know. He was working. His wife was working, you know. Oh, Jesus, beautiful. I says, my God, is this a great way, you know. And we were on our way to a meeting and he pulled into the gas station and he said to the gas guy there, you know, fill it up. I said, by Jesus, if I can ever do that, I'll never drink again. <laughs> if I could ever pull into the gas station with my old flumpy flump car like this, you know, holes in the floor, you know, and one of these where the sun visor is real loose that it keeps falling down, you keep putting it up, you know. I said, if I can ever do that, I'll never drink again. You know, and I have such a hard time of saying fill her up. You know, I have such a hard time. I do it sometimes, and my wife makes me do it if we're going on a long trip. On the way up here uh, uh, yesterday, I pulled in, got twenty-five dollars worth. I wouldn't fill it up. There's something about it that uh, it's so exciting thing for me. You know, <laughs> pull in and say pull in, fill her up. But you know, since I've been in the program, you know. There's many times that, that I pulled into the gas station and say, fill her up, you know. And, and I didn't have to give him my watch. I didn't have to give him my spare tire, you know. 
I never had to leave my buddy there and, uh, and let him run away when I get down around the corner. I never had to do these things, you know. See, you people had taught me how to try and do things right. And the longer I try and the more I try to do things right, the majority of things that come back my way are good stuff. You know, it's good stuff. And I like that, you know. I pray to my higher power every day. And I get up in the morning and have my coffee and I do my reading, you know. And that has, uh, at first that was a hard thing to get into, to do, without rushing out the door and everything. But now, if I don't do it, it's sort of an off day for me, you know. It's a part of my day that I have to do that, you know. I've I've had some beautiful things. I got to see my kids after 18 years. Uh, uh, never never see my kids, and I got to see them again. They were only just little babies when they were taken away from me, you know. And I was standing up there, you know, with my hands behind my back like this, you know. And the old judge was telling me that I wasn't a dad, you know. I wasn't a father. I was nothing, you know. And when people used to talk to me like that, I used to agree with them. Because I wasn't, you know. Eighteen years later, I got to see my kids, you know. It's amazing, amazing what things happen, you know, when we try to do the right things in Alcoholics Anonymous. Amazing, amazing things that's happened, you know, to me. I hear Peter giving me the, the word. <laughs> <laughs> we we got our own contact, you know. <laughs> yeah, he just either stumps his feet or whatever, you know. Yeah, we've had some great times in in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and, and uh, Peter and I the conventions and everything else, and, you know. And 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 uh, the thing is, we we've had some. Some some sad times and some hurt times and everything in this program, but I never had to take a drink. My God, my two sons, uh, I married, uh, the, the last girl I married had, had two little boys, you know, 12 and 13 years old. You know, and the 13-year-old boy was, was the dad of the home, you know. And then I walk in there, bad enough just walking into the family, but here I was, new in sobriety, and I knew how to handle everything, you know, for the, the first couple of months. Uh, uh, first couple of years, or first ten years, I would say, probably, you know, and, and we had lots and lots of uh, 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 headaches and lots of uh, uh, fights and everything along the way, and we used to sit around P Peter's table, and, and uh, uh, I got to marry my wife uh, sober. My kids never see me take a drink, you know, and then we sit around the tables, and my wife sat at one end, and I was at the other end, and Peter and Catty in between us, and we would fight across the table, you know, fight and fight and fight at each other. And and I used to say to her, well, God damn it, why didn't you tell me that, you know? And she was scared to tell me these things, you know, because the fear was still into our home at that time, you know. The fear of, of, see, of alcoholism and everything was still in our home, and they never seen me take a drink, eh? I would start raving sober, you know. <laughs> and I get so bad, you know, that uh, Peter would say to me and my wife, you go upstairs and go to bed. You know, he said, you're not going home like this. You know, she'd sleep on one side of the bed, I'd sleep on the other side of the bed. There's room enough for two more people in our bed a lot of times. <laughs> you know, lots of times the room for more people, you know. Not much room, I'm guaranteed, today in our bed, you know, for anyone else, you know. It's nice to wake up in the morning, you know, and know that son of a gun, you know, I'm going to try and do my best today, you know. I'm very grateful, you know, that I have a program. It says, oh, oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the wind, and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me, I am small and weak, I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in the beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made and my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may understand the things you have taught my people. Let me learn the lessons you have written in every leaf and rock. I seek strength 
not to be greater than my brothers, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes, so when life fades as the fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Thank you. Yeah. Good. I knew that was going to happen because those guys from the East Coast, they always want that extra half hour. <laughs> the girl that read the Twelve Traditions here for me at the start, last Thursday she had 22 years. <laughs> the, program, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works, and that's why we're here. We're... So I like that uh, team they have there, the gathering of miracles. It is true. It is true. Because I remember laying around in the afternoon, in the hot afternoon, Station Road in Walla, where I sobered up and kids throwing stones at me and having a little laugh, spark cry. The respect I got when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous instantly, they asked me one time to bless the food way up when we had a conference in Wawa. And I said, uh, when I started, let's all stand up. And I said, then I said, let's all bow our heads. And everyone, like, everybody went like that. That was so good, I wanted to do it over again. <laughs> <laughs> you people are special. Your people are the best. You people are A1. You people are here because that's where the Creator set you to be. Now, whatever you, how you got here, it's no matter. No one ever mind. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.